preaching to the choir here a little bit. Um, I, I feel like simulation is quite well established in emergency medicine, but I'm going to go with it. I mean, you've all uh, been working with part task trainers, you've tried intubating, doing some CPR, IO needle insertion, suturing. We don't really need those here, do we? <laughs> well, I, I must say that the whole like watch one, do one, teach one attitude doesn't really do our first patients very many favours, does it? And um, I, I know when I was learning to put epidurals in, someone gave me a part task trainer to poke away at for about 20 minutes before I put my first one in. It was really useful just to get a hang of handling the equipment um, before you put the first needle in the first patient. So just bear that in mind um, for those quiet times that you sometimes have at work, you know, part-task trainers might still be useful. And another way that you may, may have been simulating already without realizing it is when you sit around and tell war stories uh, about your hectic cases to your colleagues. Tell them just to work through them, to kind of try and understand them, um, process them, just a way to debrief, like, what the fudge, did that really happen? Did it happen like that? So you gather your colleagues around you, there's trusted ones uh, who work with you and you let rip with your epic case. And the people around you are all picturing it in their mind as you're talking. And as you, really, as you reveal each progression of the case, they're imagining themselves in the lead role here. Uh, and when they're exposed to a similar case in the future, they'll already have gone through part of those thought processes. And that's actually a simulation. So you've been doing it without even thinking it. I wonder when you saw that I was going to be talking about simulation, whether you thought I'd be talking about simulating in these really high-tech, fancy-pants simulation labs, um, these real megabuck setups. Anyone got access to these? Lots of green papers going up everywhere. Yep, one or two. Okay. <laughs> so I certainly don't. I do all of my simulating in theatre um, at Red Cross Hospital. So I run this high-fidelity simulation program where we practice managing emergencies that might happen in anesthesia all takes place right in our theatre. Um, I've also run simulations in hotel rooms, in conference centres, in the CT scanner, in the emergency department, on the pavement outside. And I know some of you have also been running these sort of real high fidelity simulations in situ. Joe has um, sent me some amazing uh, photos and you can play that video there um, on the right. Yeah, um, this was from an AMS um, uh, simulation that they did a few months ago where they transferred a patient from the uh, ICU at Somerset Hospital up to theatres, cannulated them for ECMO and then moved them on the road across to Grudisgear Hospital uh, to the ICU there. Um, all of it done with the ECMO running. So I would argue that running simulations in your clinical setting is actually more valuable than running them in a simulation lab. You're working in a familiar environment and the transfer of the learning from where you've been doing the simulation back into your clinical space, it's just so much easier when you're working in a space that's familiar to you than when you're working in something that's a little bit less familiar in a simulation lab. And also a great side effect of the whole system, of, of the whole exercise, is that you get to test your system using simulation. And we've had many a debrief uh, in our MEPA um, program that's moved on towards discussing holes that, and potential pitfalls in the emergency system that we've got in theatre. We've identified equipment that malfunctioned, uh, gas supplies that weren't working, and we've changed position of equipment and resources in our space just as a result of watching, a, a active, actively observing a resuscitation taking place and then all talking through it afterwards. So systems testing is actually a recognized use of simulation. You get a new CT scanner. Can the patient's bed fit in? Are you going to be able to reach the airway if you have to resuscitate them? You get a new bay in your emergency room, where should I put the suction, where's the best place for the defib? You get a whole new hospital. How do I move a patient quickly from ICU to theatre? You can do all of this using simulation without putting any patients at risk. So a very useful modality and something to think about even for the smallest thing that happens, a rearrangement of your ambulance, of the inside of your ambulance, that sort of thing. We, it can also be used for other things. For instance, we've recently developed a massive transfusion protocol at Red Cross Hospital, and it was, it's been quite a labor of love for me. But we spent time, uh, spent a long time devising the protocol, and we tested it. We ran a massive uh, hemorrhage scenario in theater. 
uh, and tested the massive transfusion protocol. Nursing staff, surgeons, anaesthetists were all on hand in theatre. Uh, they activated the massive transfusion protocol. Switchboard then got involved, uh, got the blood bank going, the porter going, the lab going. We went through one cycle uh, of delivering the massive transfusion pack using expired blood from the blood bank. And at the end of all of that, we sat down and, and spoke about how it went. So we went through it in real time. And we've made some quite profound changes to our massive transfusion protocol, despite the fact that we'd spent a lot of time. I'd spoken to blood bank beforehand and thought we'd fine-tuned it enough. So we discovered things such as the FFP that we were going to order was actually going to take 20 minutes or, or 30 minutes to defrost. So it would be better to either get FDP or to get a smaller pack of FFP, for instance. So. Testing it with a simulation means we find out those problems before we've got an actual patient. So we'll be running a second simulation in due course, and then we'll do a third one with an element of surprise in it. We won't tell them that we're going to be doing it. So that will test that. And then we'll keep on debriefing these scenarios once they happen, once we start using the transfusion protocol. We'll debrief every case that we've done. And Bron's going to be talking a bit more about debriefing. Debriefing and simulation go hand in hand. So I'm going to take you into a little bit of a different simulation space now, but still talking about uh, systems testing. Imagine you're opening up a new hospital or even just a new ER, uh, or you've rearranged your operating theatre space, which would be more my kind of thing. Augmented reality simulation can take you through, you can, you can use AR to plan and fine tune the product before you turn the first sod. So you can put patients and staff in, move them around using AR. In fact, AR and VR have really transformed the way that we're doing simulation now and, and changed the possibilities for us. They may seem like way out of our league, but actually when you consider that the price of these headsets, for instance, the Oculus uh, on, the t on the left there, which is what you can use to do the VRs that are out there, uh, cost about seven to 8,000 Rand to start with, um, versus our uh, Resussi and there with a SIM pad, which is retailing towards 100,000 Rand. So, <laughs> so they may be onto something here. Uh, this is my buddy Todd Chang from the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles. He's an emergency physician there, uh, and he's a total techno geek, and he's been doing a lot of development of simulations uh, uh, using virtual reality. This is, uh, this is him and his team at work there at the bottom. Uh, and he's actually um, promised to give any of you who have access to one of the Oculus headsets, which is what his VR uh, sims run off those 7,000 Rand ones, uh, access to a whole bunch of emergency room scenarios that he's developed already. Uh, so if that sounds interesting, you can get in touch with me and my email address will be at the end of the, um, at the, end of the talk. Here's a little test of what's out there at the moment. You can push play on that. That's not playing already. So this is, this is the VR um, space. This was actually from about a year ago, so it's moving on from there uh, already. I like this, watch out for this in sub-Saharan Africa. So, um, when I was preparing for this talk, I came across all sorts of amazing possibilities for you guys in emergency medicine. Uh, there's all sorts of simulation kit that'll help you learn about and practice for emergencies that might come your way. Uh, and simulation is really ideally placed for emergency medicine. Uh, anything can come through your door, and that really allows you to practice for it without harming any patients before they come. So. This is a, uh, a thoracotomy trainer. Is that, why is that mouse moving around? Is that me? Oh, what did I do? Oh, I know what I did. I did that. Is it going to go? Okay, hopefully that's going to disappear now. Oh, there we go. <laughs> okay, <laughs> that was very distracting. So, um, yeah, so this is a thoracotomy trainer. Uh, and this thoracotomy trainer will enable people to cut through the skin. They can separate the subcutaneous tissue, spread the ribs. They can go on to find the heart, to open the pericardium, evacuate the hematoma, even clamp the aorta. 
Uh, and it's just, it's just wonderful. There's amazing stuff out there, but obviously you can imagine this comes at a huge price. And every time you use it, you've got to replace the skin, you've got to replace the pericardium at the, at the minimum. Uh, and um, there's going to be quite a lot of wear and tear on the whole mannequin. But this is what I really love. The internet is full of hacks uh, to reproduce experiences like this, to replicate scenarios with similar haptic feedback. You can play that one for me, please. And um, this is the same. This is the thoracotomy trainer. Um, you'll see what it looks like at the bottom there. They're using an old resuscitation, old airway mannequin, a couple of balloons and surgical gloves. Uh, they've got Yankar suckers over coat hangers for the ribs that you can then spread. They give very similar haptic feedback to the, um, to the previous one that you saw. An old hockey shin pad is the sternum. So, <laughs> and very quick to reassemble at the end of it. So this um, SimHacks website is fantastic and just, it's really fun to have a look and see what people have done. And a place... Yes, oh, lost it. No, haven't, okay. Um, a place to post your own ideas as you start on your own sim journey and believe me you're going to find some and be so excited about them i keep we've got a little whatsapp chat group that we keep sharing stuff on when we think of some cool new way of moulaging something exciting so what where simulation really comes into its own is in teamwork training and crisis resource management simulation closes the gap between work as imagined and work as done uh, you know how you think that you're just looking awesome, you know, on your surfboard in the sea and if someone shows you a video of it, you're just, you know, <laughs> you're really not carving up the wave like you feel like you are. So with simulation, we do get to watch ourselves do things, but the good thing about that is that then you get to fine tune the things that aren't going so well that you're not doing so well, uh, which you don't get to do if you're not actually having a look and reflecting on what you're actually achieving and doing in your day-to-day -day work. So going through a big for instance, a big multi-trauma simulation uh, can really test a team to its limits. And it will test all the non-technical skills in addition to the technical skills. And I must say, as someone who's been into simulation for a while, this is where, this is where it really gets fun. Because the technical stuff, well, you can actually spend time on your own practicing all of that. But when you get to teams working together, that's when you're talking about managing yourself in relation to other people. Uh, and as a debriefer, finding the nuances of team action and helping teams to act more purposefully and more effectively will really impact on patient outcomes. And it's a wonderful thing to sit with a team uh, and reflect on what happened and help them to understand the motivation that each of them felt in that scenario and, and come to a new way of working together uh, just through one simulation planned carefully. So perhaps I've helped you to have, perhaps have um, persuaded you to look at SIM in a new way, perhaps I've given you some ideas uh, for where you may want to bring it back into your practice, but if you're anything like me, you're going to be thinking of all the challenges that you're going to face. And the first one is, I don't have the equipment, I don't have a mannequin, what am I going to do, it's just no way. Well, good news, you actually don't need very much to start off with. And I started out using SimMon, and I still use this app, and there's several other apps like this. It's 335 Rand at the moment from the App Store. Uh, I think you can get a, a, an Android version, but there are other, are other apps available that have got um, Android as well. And using that, I can control my iPad with my phone. And I can create a screen that looks exactly like my monitor in theater. And you can create a screen that looks exactly like the monitors that you used to, complete with the sounds. And there's nothing more powerful for an anesthetist than the sats slowly getting deeper and deeper and slower. It gets us all, you know, our hackles are up immediately. So sound and visual stimuli are very powerful. I bet you if I showed you a monitor of a patient who was going into VF, that would get a lot of you jumping off your seats. So you can run a simulation on a teddy bear, and we've done that using SimMon, and people will buy into it because you're getting that auditory and visual stimulation. So you don't need uh, as much to create uh, an authentic simulation uh, situation. It's all about how you set it up and how you discuss it with the people that you're going to be doing the simulation with. If you're all buying in uh, to the fiction contract of a simulation, people will work with you to, to get it. Um, other very simple things, this is a simple baby mannequin. I've made this compound fracture at, at a cost of, uh, I think it was about 80 cents for one page of color printing on my home computer. So I just printed out a photo of a compound fracture 
and cut it out and stuck it with press stick on my mannequin's leg, got a couple of old uh, splints and wrapped it all up. And that was it, my compound fracture, and my whole team was able to simulate around that for the theatre case that we were doing. Uh, here's some bloody swabs in my kitchen that I was making using cocoa and red food colouring and something else I can't remember at the time. But loads and loads of stuff you can do with very little money. Oh, here is a real challenge for all of us. When? When am I going to do it? How am I going to find the time? So, it's a tough one. Short simulations that slot into clinic, to your clinical workday are really great because you catch people on the run, they're there, they're in the space. Uh, there's a group out in Bristol that we work with and they've been doing 10 minute simulations in the emergency room and they work really well with a good planning. Okay, so that is a possibility. Another thing to think about, so that's short and sweet, just in time training. So you get a call, you've got a patient coming in and you know that they're in cardiac arrest, CPR is on the go, do a quick round of CPR training with a CPR mannequin right there, just so that everyone's got the feel again, they haven't done CPR for a couple of weeks maybe, and you've got the feel of that um, depth and rate uh, right there. That's just in time training. Uh, or, you know, it, it could be anything from intubating to whatever you, whatever you want. I, um, when I run my MEPA, we just take, we take all day. And the advantage of that is you're taking people out of their workspace, they're not going to get pulled back in when the clinical load gets too high. And the great thing about taking a whole day is that you can really build on it. As one, from one scenario you can build into the next one, especially when you're talking about the non-technical factors and the human factors. So those are some options for you on the time front. So now you're all keen, but you just don't really know how or how to start. And good news is that there are courses that run all over the place and that there are quite a few of us here who've done simulation and debriefing courses and we'd be more than happy to guide you. Uh, there's courses uh, running in Joburg and Bloemfontein and we've been running some uh, through UCT as well. But the really great news is coming uh, early next year is a uniquely South African simulation and debriefing program. It's in the advanced stages of development now. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit biased here because I'm obviously involved in developing it together with Bronwyn and Joe. Um, but this will be better than anything, anything else out there. And we'll keep you in the loop as to when that's coming. But in the meantime, this is an amazing resource, EM Sim Cases. People put up there, it's part of the whole foamed music, uh, movement, and these are free scenarios fully developed for you, complete with x-rays, with ECGs, with case discussions, etc. for the debrief. So really, really great resource um, put out by, uh, by people there. Debrief to Learn is a fantastic uh, website with uh, not only resources for you, but also links to really good uh, different opportunities and some online courses as well. And I'm a bit of a podcast geek. I love podcasts. Simulcast is fantastic. I listen to this in my car sometimes. And Center for Medical, Medical Simulation podcasts are also very, very, uh, very, very useful. So that's it from me. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, there's my email address. Um, I'd be more than happy to hear from you. I really hope that I'll be able to stay until the end. I'm on call today, but I'm um, really hoping to stay till the end of the session and then we can chat, but otherwise be in touch on email. <laughs>